Good morning, all. Good morning. Give me ha ha. Good morning, Carol. All right, give me a thumbs up. We are in test mode, so uh, good to see everyone here in the room and on the screen. I uh, we are uh, delighted to be uh, the third of uh, trials this week for the for our hybrid mode. So uh, please. Uh, be patient with us as we work out the bugs and uh, know that going up front and uh, we I think we will do just fine. So a few things, uh, regular housekeeping items, uh, just that we ask uh, if you are not, um, if you are not a member of RAC, we do ask that you uh, mute your screen. We also ask that um, uh, everyone not speaking at any given time, mute their mic. And uh, just a few things for folks in the room. Um, just as a reminder, this is the uh, regular convening of the Regional Advisory Council meeting. And um, we will uh, resume some of our regular protocol. Uh, we do have a couple of folks in the room uh, and a variety of staff, both online and um, uh, and here in the room. So welcome everyone. We do have a quorum. And so uh, I will ask, um, oh, uh, just, I've got some, you working on feedback? Okay. Um, we do have a couple other reminders. Uh, we will be in hybrid mode uh, for, for a while. That is the goal moving forward. Uh, we do ask that if you uh, want to join the meeting in person, that you RSVP. Um, so if you are, are wanting to come into one of the RAC meetings in the future in person, we do ask that you RSVP when you receive um, the, uh, the, uh, the Zoom announcement. Uh, aside from that, I'm going to go ahead and um, make one request and then hand that off to uh, our chair, B. Babbitt. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I would like to request that item number five on the agenda, action items, be moved um, to after uh, number three, public comments and before information items. And so with that, I will hand it off to you. Well, good morning, everyone. 
welcome. Of course, this is a first time experience for me too as chair. So uh, I will try to make sure that we acknowledge uh, anyone who uh, would like to speak. Uh, in, of course, during the, the business part of the meeting, that would mean members of, of the RAC. Um, so our, um, are we going to do introductions? You feel free to go ahead. We do have a quorum, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Um, let's go around the room and then we will uh, call on our members that are here by Zoom. So Joanne? Uh, just a reminder, please make sure to turn your microphone on. It is the little face with the voice lines coming out of it. And got it. If you're unsure, I think just I got ask it. Melissa. Yeah, I can hear me. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. I'm Joanne Ruth, uh, representing City of Colorado Springs in the area. Uh, <clears throat> Marilyn Bradish, uh, representing Colorado Springs. Marilyn Massey, representing Colorado Springs. Bill Bowles from Park County. And I'll comment that uh, I was on online meeting yesterday and about half the comments I could not hear. So make sure you speak up. Good, thank you. All right, in the room, I'll just announce since we don't have uh, microphones out there, we have uh, Melody Dow, uh, staff member with PPA, uh, PPAAA, uh, Jess B, Jess Bechtel, uh, also staff member, Melissa March, staff member, we have uh, Kathy Lowry from Teller Senior Coalition, and Erica from Silver Key Senior Services, and I'm presuming that's it because there's a big column right there. So is that it? Just you two? Okay, welcome. Right. Glad you can be here for our trial. <laughs> and um, our members online, uh, let's see, Eric. Yes, uh, Eric Bidwell. I work with DHS and um, am one of the RAC members. Carol? Uh, Carol Parks, Teller County. Jennifer? And Nemo, CCHA, Colorado Community Health Alliance, Medicaid for Park, El Paso, and Teller Counties. Wonderful. Is that, is that everyone? Did I miss anyone? Do we have any other RAC members online with us today? Hi, Rosemary Hadamio with um, the Alzheimer's Association. I am a RAC member. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, to our new hybrid meeting. And as, as, as we said at the beginning, um, this is a bit of an experiment. So bear with us if, if it takes a, li a little bit to transition from one uh, step to another. Okay, our first um, item of, of business is uh, to approve the agenda. We've had a request from Jody to move action item five up, uh, after public comments. Are there any other additions or changes to the agenda? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'll move on to uh, the minutes from our last meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to our minutes from our last meeting? I move approval. Joe Ruth has a move for approval of the agenda with its changes and the minutes. Is there a second? Second, Carol Parks. Carol Parks has seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the agenda and minutes are approved. Jody, do we have any public comments? Uh, Madam Chair, I did not receive any uh, comments in advance. All right. Well, then we move on to our action item, technical review subcommittee recommendations for the AAA grant funding for fiscal year 21-22. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is uh, this has been an interesting year to say the least, um, and so uh, I thought we'd share just some some background and uh, move forward with the TRS uh, recommendations for this year's allocations. Uh, the TRS subcommittee this uh, this time were Chris Larson as chair, uh, B. Babbitt, Marilyn Massey, Carol Parks, and Jen Nimmo. Um, the overall uh, OAA funding allocation uh, from the State Unit on Aging and the um, uh, Administration for Community Living was uh, $5,566,965. The total requests from 17 providers who applied for funding this year was $7,458,360. That is a difference of uh, over just over two hundred ninety-one thousand dollars. Excuse me, um, nearly two million dollars. Um, so when the TRS uh, met, um, they started with last year's uh, allocations because of the very small in uh, increase of just over two hundred and ninety thousand um, dollars. The initial allocation after the pre preliminary steps, um, that balance was $291,338. Uh, allowing for a $50,000 reserve, the TRS allocated the balance of $241,338 based on uh, usage and additional services uh, realized last year. The total funds allocated came to $5,516,000 $965 plus the reserve of $50,000. A couple of items to consider and to remember that under current major disaster declaration at the federal and state levels, transfers by providers can still be made within those account lines as providers determine the best usage to meet the needs of their client base uh, during COVID. Uh, we are still in uh, the, the COVID uh, precaution uh, time. It, is, uh, it looks different, as you might imagine, but we are still following um, those uh, requirements and allowances um, with our funding. I would like to highlight um, several changes from last year. Um, as you can see at the very top of your, um, of your page, at the end of your, your minutes uh, and recommended funding, Brothers Redevelopment chose not to reapply this year. Park County Senior Coalition um, has uh, gone through some changes um, since last year's uh, TRS and uh, Older Americans Act fund uh, allocations. Um, they ha now have a new executive director. And um, as you can see there um, in, on your pages, uh, if you will scroll up just to Park County Senior Coalition, should be the second page. You will see uh, uh, empty at voucher homemaker program. Uh, as you recall, several years ago, this program was dropped from Park County Senior Coalition and the Area Agency on Aging staff uh, picked that up to resume services. Uh, through the transition last year, of uh, Park County Senior Coalition leadership uh, and uh, board member decisions. Um, the AAA staff recommended keeping um, that program uh, internally to be managed um, and has done so since uh, for, for two years now. Um, the uh, Park County Senior Coalition did request funding for the voucher homemaker program there, as you see at $25,000. Uh, in conversation with the new um, uh, Park County Senior Coalition Executive Director, Jenny Danner. Uh, we came to uh, an agreement uh, to continue to uh, hold back th those funds, but I will give you some very exciting news that uh, Jenny and our staff are in uh, the works to transfer or transition that program back to Park County Senior Coalition with a goal set for January 1. Under the major disaster declaration, we will then be able to transfer funds um, to them for that program. 
So um, we are uh, excited about uh, this um, uh, this possibility. Uh, we're excited to, to see uh, the new executive director uh, taking a, uh, such a, a strong step towards um, uh, bringing this program back to Park County Senior Co uh, back to the Park County Senior Coalition um, and to be um, managed there in the county. And we appreciate that, um, that goal. So um, our staff, uh, uh, Gretchen uh, Bricker, uh, who's a supervisor for case management, uh, along with Melissa and Melody on our staff, have been working with Jenny to bring her up to speed and, um, and to uh, transition that program effective January 1. Uh, the only other change uh, that we wanted to note, uh, PPAAA, we decided to hold, uh, just as we did uh, recommendations uh, with many of the uh, providers to hold to last year's funding to allow the maximum amount of funding to go back to our providers out to the community. There is one small uh, change of $2,996 in administration that is being uh, uh, added to AAA this year. Um, that is due to the Older Americans Act administration uh, allocation, which is not allowed to be spent anywhere else. So that is a small increase to the AAA uh, budget, uh, but otherwise it is identical to last year's. Madam Chair, uh, the motion from the TRS subcommittee uh, per the uh, conversations and the meetings is to allocate uh, what you see here at the very bottom of uh, 5516965 dollars to providers and services with a reserve of fifty thousand uh, dollars. That is the motion. Um, the TRS committee would request a second. Is there a second? Second. Bill Bowles has uh, seconded the motion for approval. And uh, is there discussion? I'm sorry, the discussion is for members. Okay. Seeing no discussion in the room, any member online? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All in favor of uh, approval of the TRS report, say aye. 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 Those, oppo those opposed? <coughs> Seeing none, the um, report is approved. This report then, Jody, uh, what happens next? Yes, the next step is that we will make this uh, same presentation, albeit uh, a little condensed, um, to the um, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments Board of Directors at their June 17 meeting. And uh, with that being said, uh, providers who are here online with us and here in the room, um, you will hear uh, from Melody and I in, in, in the next couple of days um, about some uh, about some next steps. Uh, the board of directors had to move their meeting from the 9th to the 17th due to some scheduling conflicts, which means that we will have to work a little bit in advance uh, to make sure that we hit our June 30th uh, dates uh, to be able to move forward on July 1 with contracts. So um, we're gonna be um, moving uh, quickly. Uh, over the next uh, few few weeks to make sure we have everything ready to go. At this time, our uh, state unit on aging has not finalized the allocation to uh, to us. This is uh, pending the final uh, the final option letter, um, which uh, they are in process of and are planning to have to us before July one. So we are ready to go when they are. So thank you very much. Chairperson Davitt. Can you tell me who nominated, who was the first person to nominate? I missed that. Could, Jody, what, would you consider it Chris from the TRS? Or? Yes, the the uh, the motion was from the TRS committee. Okay. Um, and Bill Bowles was Thank second. You. 
Okay, well, let's, we're going to move on then to our provider presentations. Uh, this morning, we have Dr. Gloria Winter, Chief Medical Officer with the YMCA uh, here to present. Yes, thank you and good morning. Um, and Sheila is with me as well from representing from the senior center. So she's on screen there. And um, are you allowed to um, have uh, provide me access to the uh, share screen, please? Yes, will you? Uh, Great, there it is. Try the share screen. Okay. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Great. Yeah, so thank you for, again for having us. Um, Gloria Winter, Chief Medical Officer for the YMCA of the Pikes Peak Region and Sheila from the Senior Center. And we are just so pleased to continue to work with your agency. Um, Sheila's gonna share some of the specifics of um, the things that we were able to do during the height of the pandemic and then also the programs that we were able to run. And it, as, as everybody knows, it was such a, um, quick pivot to understand how we could still reach the needs of our older adults in the community and um, just the brainstorming that we did and the flexibility that your team had and allowing us to do that was um, monumental for us. So I will let Sheila explain some of the things that um, we did with our COVID outreach and then um, how they address the educational programs and then I will go into some of the specific uh, facility programs that we have before Sheila. Hey, hola, good morning. Um, I just want to let you all know that I am normally a paper person and not a speaker. And so if my nerves make me talk too quickly, somebody just raise their hand and I'll try and slow down a little bit, okay? Um, the Colorado Springs Senior Center is operated by the YMCA Pikes Peak Region. And one of the primary services that we provide that's augmented by the grant is free educational classes. They're designed to help older adults better cope with their aging needs. And the classes fall into every possible need category you can think of social, physical, emotional, occupational, and so on. We try to create a warm, welcoming environment here at the Senior Center, and it's one that ensures our patrons are always repeat supporters of the classes that we offer. So you can imagine that trying to duplicate the social environment with the advent of COVID-19 was more than a challenge. With the PACG funds, we were able to go virtual, as many of you did with your organizations, and we attempted to provide community engagement and education to the greatest number of older adults that we could, all while the doors of the senior center were closed. But even with the doors closed, it didn't stop us from reaching out to keep our in-person contact, and we're really excited about some of the results that we achieved. Using the grant funds, we were able to upgrade our old equipment and to purchase new equipment to allow us to successfully transmit virtual classes. Um, I've lost count of how many older adults we've helped discover how to use Zoom, but it was worth it because we've had more than 530 adults take our virtual classes. And I personally am still amazed at the technical equipment that you can purchase. Who knew there was an aisle that you can sit in a classroom and get a 360 degree of everything in the room and the people who are speaking? Um, it's just technology is great. So it's good. If you're online, you can feel like you're still involved in everything. Um, but the educational classes aren't the only service that we provided uh, with the PPACG funds. With the assistance of 12 volunteers, and the four staff members that we had, we organized and hand delivered over 2,500 meals directly to the homes of adults who couldn't get out and pick them up. And that's just the count for the home delivery. In total, we've distributed 7,800 meals so far, and that effort is still going on. In addition to that, we worked with other YMCA staff members. We did more than 16,000 calls of reassurance to not only our patrons and clients, but to any older adult who had a need and that effort also continues today. We partnered um, not just with the staff members, however, but we had outreach through the community. We've gotten over 8,000 handwritten cards from schools and churches and individuals who just care. And those cards were distributed to older adults as part of our efforts also. And then finally, we've delivered care packages and handled special requests for those who were unable to leave their homes due to transportation or medical issues or whatever might, the case might be. For example, we helped a husband get a birthday cake for his wife when they couldn't leave their home because they were high risk status. And we did weekly trips to carry the trash can up and down three flights of stairs for one of our patrons who broke her leg. We've had so many testimonials from grateful recipients that it's very, very, very um, satisfying. And I'd like to read one of those to you. This is from the lady who broke her leg. 
I no longer drive and living across town has made it difficult for me to be involved with very many activities at the center. With the advent of the icky old COVID, my abilities to socialize at all were like zero. The Senior Center contact has been the only contact with people that I have been able to rely on during this time. You cannot possibly know how much all of these things continue to help, not only in maintaining sanity, but quality of life for those who would be completely isolated otherwise. So I, I think that pretty much sums it up. We thank PPACG for making our successes possible and for the positive impact on the lives of our older adults in the community. We're proud of our accomplishments and look forward to continuing to work with you to make a difference. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much, Sheila. That was fantastic and just gives such a good story of the hundreds and thousands of stories that we experienced over the last year. And so I just want to recap that um, briefly for the programs that the agency supports. Um, in education at the Senior Center specifically, we were able to uh, reach 500 participants year to date. And of course, that's still going on for the end of this grant cycle. And then our Aging Mastery, which Sheila spoke to um, in, in good detail. And then our Aging Mastery Program is a education and behavior change program that you support. Um, and we, again, quickly shifted to virtual for this as soon as, as we could. And we've been able to see 91 participants. We had budgeted for 150, which is what we had done um, the previous year. And, and um, so I think that in the midst of um, a quick pivot to virtual and being able to still reach out to this many participants has been a good um, representation of, of how our two agencies have really worked together to, uh, to, to meet the community. Our Moving for Better Balance, which most of you know as well, the, the tai, tai Chi uh, Fall Prevention Program, we've reached 193 participants. We typically had budgeted for 350. Um, we might just get to that um, 200 plus here by the end of the grant cycle, but um, this is where we stand year to date. And really the thing that I want to um, recognize is again, we, we moved these, um, Moving for Better Balance is actually an exercise class. And so the challenge was, was how do we actually move a live exercise class where we are making sure that people don't fall and we keep them safe. And we do a pre and post um, assessment for outcomes. How do we actually move that to a virtual program and quick and make sure that the fidelity of this evidence-based program is still significant. And so our um, instructors and leaders and, and thank you to Sheila were able to help us do that. So we moved to an electronic wellness record system where we could do all the intake through, um, through a data platform, as well as um, the pre and post assessment measures and keep everything HIPAA compliant. So um, you all supported us in that um, pivot to an electronic wellness record system for these particular programs. And the, um, the most important part is actually the outcomes, right? So we have, like Sheila said, actually hundreds of responses because people were so isolated and stuck at home. And this was a way that they could engage um, with the same group of people uh, week in and week out to have that sense of connectedness and social cohesion and, and still actually improve in um, the goals that they had set for themselves. So we know that falls are the highest healthcare cost in the nation. And when you're stuck at home and you're not active and you're not moving, um, that risk is gonna go way up. And so we didn't wanna see that happen. So we, we have a, I have a um, little testimonial here that I wanna read and then I'll close it up. Um, so one of them says, um, Thank you so much for your great class of Moving for Better Balance. The videos you prepared, your encouragement, explanation, and willingness to answer questions made the forms easy to follow and, and remember. Many seniors miss going to the YMC exercise class, and I think we all are concerned about keeping our bodies moving while we are isolated and at home. Thank you for teaching into the new year. I know your students are eager to continue. And then here's one more. I just wanted to add my voice um, to the the excellence of what has been happening with the YMCA's virtual and in-person programs, specifically those that are offered through the Senior Center and through virtual. There are many of us who are transportation challenged and the opportunities offered us during this time have been, in some cases, life-saving. I know that it has helped me keep my sanity during this isolation by being able to connect with others and participate in activities. Before these virtual classes, I was not able to attend anything because I can no longer drive. I thank you again for all you have done. This class has been wonderful. So thank you again so much. I'm um, open to any questions that you all might have, but we just want to um, more than anything express our gratitude for your support for us to be able to continue with these programs. 
Well, thank you so much, Gloria and Sheila. Are there questions from members? Marilyn? When do you anticipate uh, having classes back in the senior facility? We have actually started at the beginning of May and it is working well. Of course, we have size um, limitations. So hopefully those will be lifted shortly too. Are there other questions? I was, I was just gonna make a comment to Marilyn. Marilyn, did you pick up on that 347 care packages that they did? <laughs> um, we have a, a project here with the RAC where we're talking about delivering some care packages. It sounds like we should talk to Sheila about that. Is yeah. that correct? <laughs> Absolutely, because we're still doing that. So um, just connect with us and we can collaborate together in that. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much for your informative presentation today. And uh, we wish you good luck in the future. Sounds like you're doing great things and you adapted so well during the COVID. Yeah, well, thank you for your encouragement. And um, we just, again, truly, truly appreciate your support. Wonderful. Well, we're going to move on to our second speaker, Lori Rossi, Project Director for the UCCS Aging Center. Lori? Hi, thanks, P. Good morning, and it's, it's good to be with you all this morning um, on behalf of myself and Magdalene Lim, our director who is on leave for a couple of weeks. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to, to present some information about the UCCS Aging Centers, Aging Families and Caregiver Program uh, and our funding proposal for the 2021-2022 contract year. Again, um, I am the, the project director at the Aging Center and I've been with them for just about a year. Um, can I, uh, I do have a, uh, some slides I'd like to share. So is that okay to do now? Yes, you should be able to share. Um, oops, sorry. I'd love to get rid of the side panel. But I'm not sure how to do that. We can't see your screen yet. Um, can you share your screen? Yeah. Um, hmm. You go to Let's see. Show. I did hit share screen. Um, Would you like us to pull it up for you, Lori? Let me try one other thing here. Um, there you go. You seeing that now? Okay. And just go to slideshow. Okay. There we go. Success. Thank you. So, oops. I think, oh my gosh. I just, okay. It's okay. There it is. Are you still seeing it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
So um, the first screen, um, which I shall move to. Oops. Lori, you may want to go up to slideshow. There I am. There you go. Okay. Shoot, when I forward, um, it just- You need to go back because you're on the last screen. You can scroll up to go to the first slide. Okay. There we go. So the first slide um, reflects the five pillars of our aging center, um, aging families and caregiver program. And uh, as well as some other, a couple of other aging center services. Um, this is an overview and um, we'll start at 12 o'clock and then work our way around clockwise. So the uh, first program I wanna mention is um, the Senior Outreach Services Program, SOS, which many of you are familiar with, which started in 2015 with our partner, uh, Silver Key Senior Services. And that is a program that identifies and refers very vulnerable at-risk older adults in the community. And aging center clinicians provide, uh, as well as um, Silver Key um, behavioral health persons um, provide mental health intervention before they reach a tipping point. Second program, caregiver counseling, um, caregiver family therapy and support groups. This is a, a core, really just a flagship program of the Aging Center uh, and it um, offers individual counseling, consultations and a whole host of caregiver classes uh, using different modalities, skill building, awareness, cognitive flexibility, self-care, and advocacy. Um, those are all emphasized to help alleviate the stress, depression, and isolation, um, and chronic disease that older persons and caregivers experience uh, as they advance through their later years in life. The third is combined with our, uh, there's two here, public information and education. Those are two separate programs that um, PPACG uh, funds. Education is, um, was new this year and it's just been such, such a success. So the, um, the public education, public information is basically, it's, it's a speaker bureau of sorts and it's a service that raises public awareness about resources and, and pressing issues for caregivers, older adults and um, the collateral material that we present um, during normal uh, during a normal environment when we don't have a pandemic on our hands, um, those materials compassionately uh, present with with our presenters uh, the relevant topics and provide an opportunity to increase understanding of the aging aging center's mission and our organization's visibility. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a couple minutes. The education service, again, uh, part of that bubble. Um, this was a new uh, focused education program, um, specifically um, working with healthcare providers, specifically um, primary care providers, and other mindful aging organizations on the topic of the underutilized Medicare annual wellness visit. The service, um, overall, it invites discussions in the community about the important components of this no cost benefit, including early screening for cognitive impairment. The last service, AAA funds for the aging center um, is another critical one. It's a memory clinic. And 
that program was first introduced in 2006 and first funded by PPACG in 2019. The clinic services uh, include a 60-minute memory function assessment, review of results, and same-day client feedback and recommendations for follow-up services. And the screenings are run by trained student clinicians and supervised by our licensed psychologists. The last circle depicted here um, on the far left, these are non-PPACG services. Um, they're, they represent the more expansive and high value neuropsychological assessments for older adults that come with referrals by providers, um, sometimes attorneys or family members used to identify cognitive defects predict functional outcomes, they support family caregivers, and sometimes um, determine decision-making capacity for older adults. Those referred to the Agent Center without any insurance are mentioned on the questionnaire that was provided to you as one of our unmet needs. So, the next slide, again, um, are really our flagship, one of our, our flagship program is caregiver counseling. And this year proved to be quite challenging as all of our services, of course, had been in person. Um, this year, we were very surprised to see actually the number of caregivers that embraced um, our new teletherapy, uh, our new telehealth caregiver therapy and support groups. Um, so although we did shut down for a couple of months to retool, um, we continued to support during the crisis uh, after retooling these services um, while continuously responding to health and safety mandates and we were responding to UCCS, the county and state mandates. So it was, um, the challenge was um, extraordinary, but uh, we did manage to pull together some amazing telehealth services for the clients we serve. And those um, were both uh, phone and video. And again, for the caregivers, they were really embraced um, because they alleviated safety concerns for them to come into the aging center. And they removed service barriers for their rather challenging schedules. As we move forward, the in-person services for this program are constantly being reviewed and considered due to isolation and in some, in some circumstances, unconducive home environments um, to, to have those video, um, um, those video service uh, sessions with us. So we are opening the center. We've begun that. And um, to date through April, we've actually uh, provided 78% of the service units that we committed uh, for this contract year. Um, this, this, the next two slides um, just give some stories um, and their narratives. Um, I think the takeaway with the stories here that I share is that the support we give caregivers um, for this program makes um, a difference in their lives, a tremendous difference in their lives. And it, it gives them coping tools and new and different perspectives, especially on how to meet those they care for where they are mm -hmm. and how to learn when to let go uh, of things that are out of their control and accept the unknown, um, certainly of some of the diagnoses that their loved ones are receiving. It also informs them of other services um, 
of value to them that are available at the aging center. So again, the narratives sh shift dramatically after both the care, either the caregivers or the caregivers and their um, family members have received many of our services, um, especially the, the therapy, individual and group therapy. The caregiver uh, classes are typically six weeks of sessions. So um, they move every six weeks or so. And um, again, they're, they're just invaluable and, and um, highly sought after by people in the community. This is just another story um, about a, an older adult and their adult child and um, the need to support him um, without making him feel bad about himself and trying to figure out how to remind about medication and <laughs> accepting um, his diagnosis of dementia and again, coming to terms with enjoying the time together and talking about um, whatever may present itself. And um, both of them found the therapy sessions very helpful and the classes and it helped alleviate anxiety and fear. <clears throat> the senior outreach services, um, again, SOS, um, still a very strong and um, needed service in the community. So how does it work? Um, a community member identifies an older adult who may need help. This is a program that really engages, again, not just um, an older adult that might need the service, but the, the community and neighborhood um, and neighbors around them. It trains people to identify um, high risk, vulnerable adults that may need help. And so it involves a call in to the SOS phone line and then silver key case managers reaching out to contact the older adult and getting their permission to intervene and to help determine what their needs might be. Appropriate services are identified and then based on the needs assessment, the individual may be referred for SOS behavioral health services, uh, which are often in home. And when appropriate, also referred for cognitive assessments by the UCCS Aging Center clinicians. And this also was, again, um, pretty challenging this year. Um, our students and, um, and the older adults um, had to be considered um, the levels of risk to go into the home were high. And as a result, um, you know, our numbers were not as high as a typical year, but we did have, we'll go to the next slide. We did have 169 service units fulfilled. Um, that's just through April. Again, we have another couple of months. Um, to go and then 87 um, counseling clients were seen. So again, the goal of SOS is always to identify um, high risk persons um, before the tipping point and to help maintain their independence as long as possible, uh, often in, their in the home that they're living in. This next slide is um, it kind of a combination of our public education 
and the education programs. Again, those that were in that blue bubble on, the, on one of the first slides. And this slide um, really is, um, it speaks to the, um, the fact that the pandemic was really a catalyst for some innovative ways to reach out and communicate to the community. We had a number of highly successful virtual events uh, with all the partners um, on the, that you see on the screen here. And we continue to write articles for Life After 50. We have direct partnerships as well with Peak View Behavioral Health, Rocky Mountain Pace and Silver Key, of course. And they all contribute to meeting the community needs of public information. The um, other way we often provide um, education and public information are in-facility mm -hmm. trainings by our student clinicians. So we were successful in bringing about 741 information service units to the community this year. That was 74% of our budgeted uh, projected uh, service units. And again, that's just through April. The, um, again, um, opportunity to, to flip to virtual, um, through your support, uh, the agencies, CPACG agents, uh, the AAA uh, support and flexibility was, um, I, I mean, it, it's, it, was in, it was incredible because we just had to test out so many different um, ways of continuing to communicate and get information out to the community. And uh, the events were very successful, often, um, reaching more persons than we expected. Um, and uh, so we really appreciated all that flexibility. The education component, our program here at the bottom, we uh, target two of these events per month. And um, we are about 80% to date in, um, again, through April in meeting our um, projected education events. And this education service is very specific. We had, um, we had included in our um, RFP an invitation to our, uh, a copy of an invitation to our community partners to participate in these outreach events. And it's all about exploring the benefits and barriers to the underutilized Medicare annual wellness visit. And what this does is it connects with primary care providers and community collaborators to, uh, to highlight this underutilized fully paid benefit, especially in diverse population communities um, to discuss the barriers and its use and to provide aging center clinical training to primary care physicians for the visits required brief cognitive screening and follow-up care if needed. So again, um, it's, a, it's a visit you may, many of you may have heard about. Um, met many people, um, there's, there tends to be a lot of confusion about it out there. Um, often it's, even though it is a, um, a required visit every year, it's, it's, not being, uh, it's not being held as often as it should. And what's included in this highly valuable visit is a review and update of medical and family history. Um, and it assesses for any possible cognitive impairment. Again, that is key to what the aging center does. It reviews potential risk factors for depression, including current and past experiences um, with depression or other mood disorders. 
It reviews functional ability and level of safety. And it establishes a, or updates a written screen, screening schedule for the individual for the next five to 10 years based on their health status, um, among, among a few other things. So it's, it's a visit that is atypical. Many older adults see it as an annual physical. They often think that that's what it is, but in fact, it's, it's really not. It does not focus on the physical aspects of, um, of their health uh, and when in fact something specific to their physical health um, or disease management is um, discussed in the meeting, they actually can see possibly a co-payment uh, show up in their mailbox. So we're, we're just, we're, we're trying to help them understand that, you know, if it's possible to keep that issue separate for their next visit um, because the hour long visit really tackles some other very, very important, um, more preventive aspects of their health. And, um, and again, that very underutilized um, brief cognitive screen that we're finding out many PCPs have a lot of challenges with, and we actually uh, know how to um, conduct those screenings, and we are offering training to primary care physicians uh, to do that. Um, our first one will be coming up in um, uh, July or August, uh, probably with Peak Vista. So we're actually really, really excited about that, and the, the word is starting to get around. Oops. The last program, um, our last service I'll talk about is our memories, memory clinic. Uh, and again, these are uh, very, um, they're important screens, unfortunately are not covered by Medicare. And so the sliding scale fee that is supported by AAA funding is absolutely essential. Um, these screens, can only be done in purpose, uh, in, I'm sorry, in person. And so we unfortunately, um, you know, did see uh, lower numbers of these uh, conducted this year uh, as a result of the in-person requirement. However, due to um, all of our education and research on how to conduct these in a way that, um, as soon as we were able to invite people back into the clinic, we're able to use two side-by-side -side rooms with two screens, prompt the uh, person receiving the memory screen um, on how to work with us in the next room on another screen. And um, it's been very, very successful and we're very excited about it. So uh, although it, you know, we've been compromised um, with these visits due to COVID, we're, we're seeing um, more and more appointments uh, over the last month or so. And um, for those persons that really did need an urgent um, memory screen, we did take them in earlier. Uh, to do this and, and used this dual room technique. Those were very few. If, if they needed something um, more critical than just a baseline memory um, measurement, we did allow a few in. Um, but um, again, now that things have opened up, we are uh, doing this more routinely and it's, being, it's, it's, it's proving to be quite successful. And the reason why these memory screens are so important is that they can identify normal memory issues with ones that may require additional diagnosis. And there just is such a, such a stigma about memory that uh, it's, it's just so critical to help person, help people understand that a lot of times there are normal things occurring with memory based on age that um, their anxieties can be alleviated just by coming in 
and getting it checked out. So um, that's all I have. I guess um, if I might suggest a couple of, of takeaways for today, and that's that our services are very unique in the community and the numbers of those we serve is growing every year. We're not a large facility, but we're a highly trained one that rarely if ever turns away clients who need us. So often it's a delicate balancing act for us to serve while maintaining manageable wait lists. So as we look to our successes, especially in treating the older adults and caregivers who are part of our own communities and in fact, our own families um, who can't afford care elsewhere. We look to AAA, um, our partner who knows our work and our history uh, to continue to carry us forward. Well, so thank you. I, thank you very much for the time and the opportunity and would welcome any questions. Thank you, Lori. Um, do any members have questions for Lori? Marilyn? Hello, Lori. I'm wondering, now that you have um, championed the online abilities to be of service in these categories, will you, um, are you considering doing the hybrid both in person and continue the online? Absolutely, yep. We, um, we are seeing um, in certain families uh, the just again, especially with respect to caregivers and their yes. schedules, um, many of them are preferring this modality. And uh, yes, we are, um, again, um, wanting to offer both and will. And we're just still not even in full-fledged, um, you know, open center um, mode yet. We are continuously, again, with the university um, requirements as well as state and county, continuing to measure that, um, those risks. Um, the, the concern about um, keeping our clients and our younger, you know, the younger population of students who are our clinicians safe, um, just are not going away yet. So in answer to your question, Yes, we'll be we'll be doing. My both. reason for asking that question was, do you are you um, have a specific service area, or could these services online be offered to like Park and Teller County people? Well, I know um, I that our geographic region is um, both El Paso and um, and Teller. Um, to go beyond that um, would um, require some discussions uh, and I could certainly inquire with the director and um, get back to you, but we are in both of those counties um, and have been since the start of our um, 501c3. Um, well, what I was thinking of is people, uh, as you mentioned, their caregivers are in a situation where they can't just take off. They gotta have somebody that is going to take care of the individual while they're absent. And I was just thinking that the services you offer are probably um, desired by many people that may even not even know they exist. And um, I was just concerned about how, how you can expand what we've learned. In other words, what we have we learned during this pandemic that can now be utilized to help people that are in a situation where travel is difficult. Yeah. So it's certainly something that I can um, bring to the director. Um, so you're specifically talking about going beyond our designated 501c3 charter borders of, um, of uh, El Paso and Teller counties. Well, I'm asking if that's a possibility uh, yeah. um, because we have representatives here of Park County and I know that their, their uh, opportunities are limited. I don't know that what I'm saying deserves a consultation with your assigned area, but I do think it should be something that's in the back of your mind or taken into consideration because you've learned a lot. 
and you've learned that these can be provided to many people. Now, I personally used your memory clinic twice now, and I'm now that you say it's open again, I'd like to go get a third, it's been a couple of years, <laughs> I'd like another analysis. And just for, um, under, for you to understand how the physicians are responding to these um, annual wellness checks, my physician does that. And they actually were, would, I felt they weren't gonna let me out until I made a, another appointment for the next one. <laughs> And, but the questions that were asked were pretty much things that, um, you know, we would see during one of the consultations with your cl clinicians, as far as asking the questions and having the list to check off and are you, you know, how are you feeling? So I'm just sharing that with you. So you'll know that the, some of the positions are listening and participating. That's really great to hear and encouraging. Um, you know, the, the research and the statistics um, that have been running since this annual wellness visit uh, became available, which goes back to 20, <coughs> I believe, 2011, when the, I believe that's when the Affordable Care Act um, took hold. Uh, had the the numbers are are quite low, and they're and they're astoundingly low in diverse communities, and um, so it's very encouraging. And I appreciate you sharing that with me because I love to hear that. Um, a lot of um, people in my circle have conveyed some some very different stories, and um, it seems to be that. Um, if the physicians are not um, doing outreach about this, many just are just unaware of it for starters, and um, and that needs to change. So I appreciate you sharing that with me, Marilyn. The physician I go to has a lot of nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. so maybe there's an opportunity for you to do a session just for nurse practitioners, because I I don't know how. I only know my own doctor, so I don't know how frequent that is that they use the practitioners, but um, um, they might be more willing to listen. <laughs> yeah, and actually, these um, annual wellness visits do not need to be conducted by the physician as long as the medical um, practitioner in the office is overseen, you know, as long as the clinic is or, or office is overseen by, um, by a, a licensed physician. They, uh, these visits can be done by MAs, um, nurse practitioners, um, PAs, um, and so, Great. yeah. Well, thank you, Lori. Uh, we appreciate your presentation and your questions, Marilyn. And um, th thank you again for being with us this morning. We're You're going to welcome. move on. We're going to move on to membership. Marilyn, you have a report for us? Um, yes, thank you, B. Um, membership is striving toward expanding our base uh, with a wide range of representation. And kind of a, a latest effort that we have going on is uh, attempting to reach out to our communities of color, uh, our more underrepresented populations, to be able to hear their needs and access services to them. So seeking members of diversity um, I had the opportunity, um, along with several members here, um, to be part of an idea sharing, uh, productive one and a half hour discussion regarding the underrepresented and community of color outreach for older adults uh, conversation on May the 10th. Um, leading the discussion were several wonderful people of diverse backgrounds. Uh, one that name that you'll recognize, Cynthia Aki, uh, was a former member representing the Asian American population. Um, there was representation from uh, Indian Affairs, from um, the LGBT community, um, respite care. Um, and so it was a great discussion about how we might be able to find these people, access them and let them know what services are available 
um, with uh, the rack. And so, you know, lots of things were tossed around, but we came down to a few uh, things that could be done um, that we can go to events that we might be able to reach out to people uh, to bring our yellow, uh, the yellow book um, to several events coming up. One of which was what Cynthia uh, talked about was a Korean uh, picnic that happened on May the 19th um, that I think B said she, that you were gonna go to, so we'll let you talk about that. Uh, upcoming is um, the Juneteenth celebration uh, on June 19th, which I am going to attend uh, to just, you know, kind of network, bring the, bring the yellow book, set up a booth, whatever. Um, there's a multicultural um, festival coming up in August that might represent several areas of diversity uh, and just be able to, you know, possibly reach out to people there and see if there um, are any of them that, you know, think that they would like to become members of the RAC committee. So those are just some things coming up that hopefully, you know, we'll see if we can find representation from uh, some cultural diversity coming up. And B, if you want to just say a few sure, words about um, the Korean uh, picnic. Yes, it's, it was uh, Asian American uh -huh. um, a picnic we attended on, when I say we, because Joe was also there. Uh, Joe Ruth was also there. Um, we attended a, a lovely picnic they had at Bear Creek Park. And they had a, a nice turnout, good food. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, talk to quite a few different people. We, unfortunately, the weather cut the picnic short. All of a sudden, uh, the, it was about to rain. And so there was a lot of scrambling uh, and we had to leave. So we did not we did not get a chance to do as much as we wanted to do. We were going to ha have a little talk, you know, and, and tell people a little bit about um, the rack and so forth. But we did have a chance to talk to some individuals. And Joe, would you like to speak to that? Yes, this was, this was just a delightful picnic of, of, of several different Asian ethnic groups, mm -hmm. and there were uh, older people there, there were young people, there were children. They were very interactive and very um, uh, friendly to have us there. They, they were eager to talk with us. Uh, B and I had separate conversations with several of the group. There was even one young woman who, when we explained what the RAC was, she she said, and is there an age, uh, very shyly, she said, is there an age requirement? And B said, yes, there was, but we had that met and we need both young and older people. She is a real go-getter and wanted to know more about our rack even before we were had the opportunity to have the interference with the weather. But um, <laughs> it, was, it, was a very, it was a very nice event. The other thing I would like to add is that I have had conversations with uh, three different uh, women from the Black community. Uh, there are some very active groups here. And as soon as we have a little more information to share with them, I will, I will be in more contact with, with a larger group. So hopefully by the time we get to Juneteenth, we will be able to have people involved and know what is happening and we can really talk that up. I don't know if that can happen for sure, but I would certainly like to move toward that arena. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities and know that there is a community of, of needs that, that we, none of us in our community know how to solve by ourselves. We can solve it together. Uh, we can work on it and we can make ourselves known in this community as an agency that says we can do something and we do do something. So that's the way this works. Uh, if we want to build trust, we have to be trustworthy. And uh, when we talk in communication, we have to be able to say, 
with an open heart what it is that we are doing and what we want to share with our, our city. We have a unique opportunity here because we have a strong, vibrant um, community that does care. And as we look at the aging, uh, the positive events that have happened citywide, I think we have a good opportunity to, to commit to that and to work on it. So I just was really pleased that we had that opportunity. And thank you, B, for, for making that possible for us to go. Well, and, and thank you. I, I'll bring it up in a few minutes, but thank you for all the people that participated in, in that conversation, Marilyn. And then all the people that said, well, I can attend this event, I can attend that event, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of uh, interest and there's also people that are going to take their time and go out and meet with the various communities. So I appreciate that. Is that it then, Marilyn? Yes, thank you. Thank you so well said, thank you. Um, Jen, um, do you have a report from the SRS committee? Yes, we met um, this May on the 13th uh, and we've been able to further work on our blueprint two-pager document and create several different action items. Um, from that, we also participated with the TRS process and um, attended the 5310 funding meetings to uh, make sure that all the needs of the strategic and four-year plans are being addressed with both of those um, projects. So um, all went well, and we will be meeting again in uh, another three months, I think August. Yeah, August. Okay, thank you. Somehow we managed to, to get all these meetings, diversity, SRS, TRS, transportation. We managed to do all those in the same week. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, it was quite the week, B. I really appreciate all your help on that and everyone else who was involved. It was it was a it was a week. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it was a week. It sure was. And yeah, but, but I uh, I was really pleased to see the participation of our members. So people were interested in all the issues and, and contributing to, to all those. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, B. Jody. Thank you, B. Yes, uh, that is one thing that um, hasn't changed is we, we're staying busy. And so that's exciting. So uh, bear with me as I work through some of these updates. Um, but also uh, just wanted to thank um, all the providers uh, for your work during the time of COVID and the challenges that, uh, that you faced um, in that service delivery and willingness and ability to, uh, to transition, uh, try new things, um, it has been a real challenge, and I know that will continue for a while, um, but I love the uh, creativity uh, that has come out of this, uh, this challenging environment. Uh, and that's uh, really where I'll kick off my, uh, my presentation, my, my update, uh, is that there are uh, expected to be a portion of funds uh, coming in as part of the American Recovery Act, excuse me, American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA. It's not nearly as catchy as CARES Act, but uh, it'll do. Um, there will be a significant amount of funds coming into the state of Colorado specifically for aging and adult services. Um, at this time, however, we don't know when that will actually be um, or what the, the overall expectations will look like. Uh, we are uh, hearing some early information from the State Unit on Aging and uh, providers. Uh, those of you who join the uh, regular update meetings have, uh, are certainly hearing some of this as well, but um, we, they did uh, find out about three days before they received their option letter at the state that there will be, um, uh, there will be match required uh, for this new package of funding. So with that being said, there are a lot of details yet to work out as we hear more from the state uh, as they begin to uh, determine how that uh, will be distributed and used. So um, I do want to uh, just let you know that, uh, like I, I said earlier, uh, June and July are um, kind of test months for us here at PPACG and AAA as we 
uh, determine how best to move forward. Um, during the month of June is kind of uh, as uh, Andy Gunning, our executive director is calling it our soft opening. Um, and so uh, what that means is the door will physically be locked still as we continue to figure out how best to, uh, to manage the, the space and, the, and, uh, and staffing uh, safety as has been mentioned here before. However, uh, just as that uh, the day uh, last year in March when we had to close our doors and move uh, to work remotely, we are still all available um, and staff are happy to help continue supporting um, our providers uh, as well as work with um, our uh, advisory council. So thank you very much. I do want to remind you at least for the next couple months uh, for the meetings that will be here, we do ask that you provide uh, that you respond uh, that uh, with an RSVP that you'd like to be here in person uh, for uh, uh, for meetings as we are trying to um, uh, watch our space uh, right now. We have plenty of room uh, for the time being. And so we just ask that you RSVP for meetings. Um, through the month of uh, June and July, again, uh, we will be transitioning. I'm uh, making some changes uh, the way we operate with uh, AAA staff uh, to ensure um, uh, the best efficiency and uh, whatever the uh, new normal uh, I've really come to hate that description, but whatever that new normal needs to look like, we will figure that out. So bear with us. Uh, the bulk of emer emergency uh, CARES Act uh, stimulus funding um, has been spent uh, across these last 14 months. Um, there will be a small balance that will be drawn at the end of the contract period, which is June 30th, and um, that'll be redistributed. Uh, so for uh, providers, um, you will be hearing from us probably in, uh, towards the end of July once we have all of those numbers in hand uh, to see what might still be available. And just as a reminder um, to both the RAC members as well as our providers, uh, because we continue to be under the major disaster declaration, full transfers are still available to you. Um, and that deadline is the 15th of the month um, to me for those requests. So um, just be aware of that. And we did find out too, just for clarification, if uh, when, uh, because it's not really an if, we know that the major disaster declaration uh, will be lifted at some point. Any funding that was provided and allocated during the major disaster declaration will continue to have the same rules. Um, and so transfers are still going to be available uh, whenever that uh, declaration does get lifted. So that uh, we won't be hitting a cliff, a cliff as it were, uh, as it relates to some of the funding and some of our operations. So that's, uh, I know I was glad to hear that. <laughs> Uh, because that has been a concern of all uh, AAAs across the state and I'm sure nationwide. So, uh, so just know that that um, flexibility will still be there for a while. Um, and uh, as we know more, we of course be sharing more. Um, a few things around our programs, as mentioned, we still have plenty of yellow books available. So please uh, feel free to call your favorite staff member and make arrangements to pick those up. Um, Melissa has uh, continued to uh, be a fantastic delivery person. So uh, if you need more than a few boxes uh, uh, delivered, just give us a call and we will uh, figure that out. We have several, mem several staff members with trucks and we're happy to load them up for you. So uh, we are happy to bring those to you. If you need just a few, we continue to fill the boxes at the bottom of the steps. Those are available to you as well. Um, we uh, This year, uh, we, uh, as you know, were asked by the Int uh, Federal Credit Union uh, to increase the amount, not just the amount of Int Retirement Series classes, but also expand those statewide. Um, those went to 10 for this year. We've now uh, wrapping up our fifth and have five more to do uh, later in the fall. That'll be um, after, after the summertime, uh, there'll be five more. And the attendance on those um, probably ha uh, 
because of the Zoom environment, um, being able to attend and not have to leave work to rush over here at four o'clock in the afternoon uh, for those um, has, uh, has increased um, just exponentially. Uh, we're seeing attendance in the um, uh, over 100 uh, in most of those presentations this time. So that's been very exciting uh, to see that and to know that this is the seventh year for the Int Retirement Series and for them to ask us to expand. Um, that has been um, a big uh, project for the staff, in particular our um, case management staff that normally uh, do that, but uh, Pam Hogard and uh, Barbara Sigmund have taken that on and expanded that. And so we thank uh, everyone, all of our staff uh, who have been involved uh, from IT to um, uh, communications uh, to Melissa and others in sharing that, um, making that happen. So that has been uh, very exciting. Our annual caregiver pampering day, uh, as you, as many of you recall, that usually happens in February. Uh, this year was put off to May 1st. Um, we, uh, we, our staff, uh, um, Kent Matthews and his Family Caregiver Support Center staff, along with some other staff members, 21 volunteers, uh, helped to put on uh, a bit of a different caregiver pampering day this year. It was in seven different locations instead of one big one at the Colorado Springs Senior Center. And we had 33 caregivers uh, attend. And so we were spread out across the city and uh, was just a really great opportunity for those caregivers to have that, um, uh, have that opportunity to be pampered in a little different way. Uh, than we've done in the past, but I'm so uh, so pleased with the the staff and the volunteers who helped make that happen and support our caregivers across the city. Um, there will be another round of FEMA food boxes. Uh, as many of you recall, we were able to receive 23 pallets of 30-day emergency food boxes. Um, the uh, FEMA and State Unit on Aging uh, and Colorado Department of Human Services are partnering again to have another round uh, delivered. And so those of you who are with us today uh, live or uh, by Zoom, uh, if you were a partnering agency to distribute those, uh, Melissa will be heading up the charge this time around. And so be watching for an email uh, to let us know if you would like another round of those. Um, we do anticipate that they will be identical to the, to the first round back in February. So uh, be watching for more information about that. If you have ideas about organizations that might uh, be able to distribute these boxes for us, please be in touch with uh, Melissa Martz, uh, our staff member here, um, who will help organize that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because we're now going back to our uh, an in-person uh, hybrid scenario, we will not have space to store them here like we did last time. We had several pallets um, that we uh, held here as carryover and distributed ourselves. We will look to get those completely distributed out through the community this time. So any ideas, any communities, any leaders who could uh, distribute these, we would love to hear that. The only requirement is that they go to uh, folks over age 60. Um, let's see here. We do have a small funding package anticipated around uh, vaccination, education, and transportation. Um, and so more to come on that. At this point, we don't know uh, how much, when it will arrive, or how it's expected to be used. So uh, more to come on that. Um, just a couple more things for me. Uh, I want to give some thank yous. Uh, first of all, uh, as many of you know, Joyce Whittle was a board member and uh, here, excuse me, a RAC member here with us and also served as the uh, board president with Pike, uh, Park County Senior Coalition during the transition last year in their, uh, in their leadership and makeup. Um, she worked with the board of directors, took on the interim executive director position. Um, and I would just like to say a big public thank you to Joyce for uh, carrying on with the board of directors 
uh, support and help um, making sure that Park County Senior Coalition could continue to serve the uh, the, the members of Park County. So um, so we're we're pleased that that was able to be maintained and um, that they uh, continue to um, to serve the, the the seniors of Park County. We do have uh, here at Area Agency on Aging. We have two retiring employees. Um, and so just wanted to share that with you. Michelle Lamborski is uh, with the Family Caregiver Support Center. Uh, her last day is Friday. And so we're, uh, we're gonna be sad to see her go, but it's a full on retirement. She's in grandma duty, duty now. And so we'll be, uh, she'll be moving out of state to take on that new, new chapter in her life. And that position will be posted soon. Uh, we also have Jeannie Dennis, who is a long-term care ombudsman, and uh, that position was just posted this week. So we are looking for a new ombudsman um, to join our staff. Um, we also have a new position that's in process. It has been posted. It uh, closes uh, here in a few days, and that's a new front desk administrative assistant. Those of you who um, who might remember Dreema, who checked people in upstairs if you came in for meetings. Uh, when she left, we've had a big gap there for some time. Staff have um, taken on bits and parts of her previous role um, and now with uh, our new normals and, and trying to figure out what, uh, what we need to do here. Uh, you will, uh, those of you who had, uh, have not been in the building uh, for some time, notice the giant desk was moved uh, administrative desk was moved from upstairs to downstairs. We have that here now in our front lobby here off of Chestnut Street. And uh, we are uh, going to be filling that position soon. So there'll be some new processes and we're very excited uh, for that, uh, that uh, position to be filled as I know several of our staff, member, staff members are excited to see that filled as well. And then just a last personal thank you for me. Uh, the time that I was away, uh, we were talking this morning before the meeting started. Uh, there's a big difference in uh, talking about caregiving and being a caregiver. And so the last, uh, the nine weeks that I was out being caregiver for my folks, uh, it was not what uh, was anticipated to be. It, came, it became about 10 times worse. And um, I kept uh, hearing from my staff with their, their suggestions and uh, support and reminders. And so, as you might imagine, I had to keep preaching to the choir in my head to say, remember what you've always said and <laughs> preached and counseled families for 20 plus years from the other side of the desk. And so I had to put those into play uh, during my time. So I just want to thank our RAC members for your patience in uh, not hearing from me on certain days. Uh, providers, uh, a little harder to get a hold of me and staff have completely championed and uh, been my right arm. So I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, that's all I have at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. We're Happy you're back. <laughs> well, in terms of my own report, I, I just basically want to say thank you to the members um, who stepped up in so many ways in the last month, um, in particular, as we, you know, at the TRS committee met under Chris's leadership. Um, Members volunteered uh, on the Specialized Transportation Committee and reviewed those proposals. Um, as was mentioned earlier, so many of our members attended the um, Diversity Outreach uh, Committee and a special thank you to Melissa for pulling us all together for that conversation. Our SRS Committee under Jen Nemo um, met and, and uh, looked at, at our objectives. Um, it, it was really, and I suppose it all hit me because it all happened in the same week and, <laughs> and I was at every meeting, so. <laughs> but I, I am just uh, really thrilled to see that kind of participation by our members. And uh, 
it always it's always very clear that each person because of your life experiences has something unique to contribute and i really uh, appreciate that you uh, did that and uh, that we are such uh, an active uh, board and I hope we continue in that mode and I think we will just based on on some objectives we have set for ourselves. Um, I also want to say congratulations to uh, uh, the, that statewide retirement series. Um, it's we started that out small and to now see it go statewide, I'm, I'm really proud of all the people involved in that as well. Um, that's all I have for today. Um, I'm excited about the future because of uh, how everyone has participated and I know we're gonna continue to do great things. We have uh, the technical, I'm gonna move on then in our agenda to the technical review subcommittee recommendation for AAA grant funding. No, no, excuse me, we did that already. Let me, let me move on, I should have put a line through that. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the discussion items. We have the 5310 presentation of applicants. Uh, is that Laura Cruz is gonna tell us about that? Yes, thanks, B. Um, I, I, I want to give some clarification. Um, the RAC typically does make a recommendation directly to the board for um, for AAA funds. However, with the uh, FTA fifty three ten grant, um, those those funds are transportation funds, and so they go through the the um, TAC and then the CAC uh, makes the final recommendation to the board. So uh, while this is um, kind of unique, um, this is a discussion item. This is not an action item today, uh, but I did wanna talk through um, the applicants as well as um, just talk about the, the uh, review committee and the results of that re review committee. And so where the recommendations kind of originated and now um, where we are in the process. So um, 5310 funding is for specialized transportation for seniors, as well as those that are um, uh, individuals with disabilities. And so it's slightly different um, funding than the AAA funding because we do have the disabled uh, population included in that that does not have the same age requirements as AAA funding. And so, uh, we launched our RFP in March, um, at the end of March, March 31st. Um, we had four applicants um, for that funding. Um, this funding it actually transitioned to us um, January 1st of this year. And so um, the program in itself transitioned from Mountain Metro Transit to PPACG. So the four that applied um, were actually the four agencies um, the MMT had been contracting for years um, to do specialized transportation. Because of the change in the program coming from um, operating under city funds um, to now transitioning into federal funds, there's just different requirements um, that were presented to the um, applicants this year. And so Luckily, we had a really awesome um, selection committee that met. We had B um, on the committee. Uh, as she mentioned, we had all these meetings in one week. <laughs> um, but I really appreciate everybody stepping in, stepping up to the plate to help us out with this. We had Jennifer Nemo. We had Eric, um, who's one of the newer members of this committee. So it was really nice to have him um, and his perspective um, as we were scoring applications. Um, we also had Mary Kemp. I think I said your name may be right or wrong. Um, she was on the committee. And then Glenn Krauss from CDOT, who is our area-wide um, project manager, um, also sat on the committee. And so having him on the committee who has reviewed applications for several years, been a, an auditor for the state of transportation programs. It was really great to have 
sort of his insight. And also he had some, some added insight about the different programs that overlap with, um, with CDOT's programs within these um, applicants. And so um, from that, we reviewed the applications. Um, I kind of stood as a sort of a, a person that answered questions for the review committee and gave clarification because this is a new funding stream for PPACG. Um, and from that, each one of the committee members scored the applications. We had a score sheet that was available to the applicants prior to a scoring and prior to them actually filling out their, their uh, proposals. And so that kind of geared the applicants in, in having a better understanding of the highlights of what they needed to uh, present in their proposals. Um, FTA requires that type of process, um, a scoring type of process to be implemented throughout the selection process. So while we had the scores, we also had some um, criteria too the, and guidance from FTA on how to kind of evaluate this. Um, I lean on them quite a bit since this is our first year. So FTA has kind of been um, really engaged in the process of making these decisions um, just from a technical assistance um, perspective. So of the four applicants, um, we had some unique um, scoring that occurred. The, the criteria that was scored and weighted um, was financial need, service justification, coordination, mission alignment, and that's mission alignment with PPACG, as well as um, the mission and the strategic plans of PPACG, as well as the four-year plan for AAA. So how well does those, um, those proposals align with that? And financial management and past performance of grants. One of the, the big things um, for, um, for federal funds is to make for sure that the applicants and, and the subrecipients have the knowledge and capability to manage the funds and also the controls in place to manage the federal funds. Um, it's a, almost a different level. Um, these agencies are having to step up to a different level to be able to have the controls in place that are required to manage this. And so of those um, criteria that were measured, the, the review committee um, looked at two agencies that were very close in alignment of their scores across the board. And those two agencies were Invita and Silver Key. The, the lower two agencies were Fountain Valley Senior Center and Community Intersections. Um, Invita, Invita and Silver Key scored really high on financial management as well as coordination. Um, and their level of coordination and what their, um, what their input was into the, the system that they had created to um, coordinate with others. And so um, those were the really high scores as well as mission alignment. So it was, um, as we were kind of talking through this, most of the um, review committee had, had the same scores for, for those agencies. And so those top two agencies we looked at and the, the review committee decided that um, to honor those full requests of those agencies um, and those full requests were a large portion of the funding that was actually available. So we originally had $958,000 um, requested of all the agencies. We only have $816,000 to dedicate to this program. So we had to make some adjustments in looking at those, um, those numbers that was requested. And so since those two top two agencies um, scored really high as well as just a general conversation amongst the, the review committee group, um, talking about the, the inputs that they saw within those organizations to help with transportation as a whole in this area, they did make the choice to um, fully fund those two organizations. Um, 
Don Valley Senior Center is a, um, a sometimes a one man show. <laughs> Uh, those of you who know Jolene, she does an amazing job um, kind of fitting into multiple roles. Um, but the, there are a few things that it, when it came to financial management of um, potentially having the controls in place for financial management of funding, um, there was some concerns there. And so those are some things over this next year that we're going to work through those concerns. Um, but we also, as a group, recognize that their service to their population is critical. Um, they are the, the only um, entity really working in the Fountain area to provide these services. And so it, it was important to the, um, to the review committee, committee not to leave them out. And so with the remainder of funds left over from um, funding, Invita as well as Silver Key, um, the review committee came to the decision to use the remainder of funds to fund Fountain Valley Senior Center. Now we had a unique situation with Community Intersections, which was the last agency um, that submitted a proposal. Um, community Intersections um, is an amazing organization that works with the um, IDD committee, community. Um, through workforce programs, as well as their own um, kind of uh, learning programs and day programs that they provide. And as the committee was working through the scoring, there was there was some, some um, overarching concerns about um, how well aligned their program was with the actual 5310 requirements. Um, also, how well did that, did their programs align with um, service justification, the coordination piece, how do people access their programs um, for transportation? Um, do, does their mission kind of align with the mission and, and strategic plans of PPACG? And did they demonstrate a, a financial need that matched up with the number of individuals that they planned on serving? And so there was concerns across the board for um, for all of those criteria. And also during the process of um, getting guidance from FTA about how our review committee should be looking at these um, proposals, one of the things that came up was um, the need or necessity for us to fund um, public transportation. <laughs> And, and so there's a, a very clear definition, definition of public transportation um, provided by the FTA. And basically what public transportation means is it has to be a service that is open to the general public. It has to be a service that um, we can refer people to, people can access either through, you know, going through the organization, access broadly. Um, they serve a broad, wider population. And so um, in looking at community intersections application, they highlighted one program, which was a great program, um, but it was a, a, a specific program to help transport people to um, a facility to do a workforce program. So it wasn't, it wasn't presented to us as an open program to the public so that we can, we can refer people to them as well as, um, um, utilize their services for the full coordination of public transportation for the specialized um, transportation um, recipients. And so um, a result of that conversation, as well as the result of the scoring, um, the review committee recommended not to fund community intersections this year. So um, we have, we had four requests. Um, it was um, the review committee really looked hard at those um, applications, really took a lot of time utilizing the score sheet to, to kind of digest those applications and came up with the, the recommendation. And so the recommendation has already gone through the TAC, which is the Transportation Committee. Um, and yesterday it was approved by the CAC to go to the board on June 17th. So um, I really appreciate 
all of you guys on this call who participated in that exercise of um, reviewing those applications. It was really helpful. Y'all had great insights. Um, as, and it, it's really hard for me to look at that many applications and make a, a decision myself. That's not my role. It's the public's role to make this decision. So I really appreciate you guys participating in that. And if any of you that were on the committee want to make any comment, feel free to now. Um, we did have some public comments um, from the providers in the TAC meeting. Um, and I did share those public comments yesterday at the CAC meeting that were um, expressed. We also have an appeal right now from community intersections um, that both Jody and I are working to address. Um, and so we're, we're going to work through that appeal process, but that does not hold up the, the funding decision by the board. Is there any questions? Thank you, Laura. Are there any questions for Laura? Comments? <laughs> Very thorough. Very thorough, right, right. Well, thank well, you so much. Uh, our hour is getting late here, so yes. I think we're going to move on. So thanks, thank you. Me. Thanks a lot. Okay, were there any other discussion items that the um, board members wanted to bring to our attention? Bill? I just want to thank the board and for the support they've given Park County this last year. That, our senior coalition is now off and running up again. So we're very excited about that bill. Yes. Anyone else want to add a comment, discussion item? I just, I just want to say how impressed I am that all of the things that that this entire group. I mean, what in the meetings that the few meetings that I've attended. And, and, and what I'm hearing today, I am so impressed that we as a group are working together, even under these very difficult circumstances. I, I hate to say it, but sometimes bitter medicine does make the sweetness go <laughs> more, more, more pleasant. And we've certainly come together. Thank you, John. I'd like to thank Marilyn and on the three of you for attending these uh, diversity areas because we've talked about this for, for six years that I know of and now we're doing something to for the community instead of talking about it we're in, doing an action so thank you thank you Marilyn anyone else anyone at a, at a distance here on zoom any of our members I guess thank you well, when we look forward, then we have our uh, June 24th meeting will also be hybrid. So as was mentioned, uh, please confirm with Melissa if you want to attend in person. So we, we'd have plenty of room here. So if you wanna come down and actually <laughs> see, see one another, come on to the meeting. Otherwise uh, we will also have attendance by Zoom. Are there any other calendar events that someone wants to bring to our attention? Well, thank you for um, your attendance today and your contributions, and we'll see you next month. I officially adjourn our RAC meeting. Bye now. And RAC members, those of you who came in today, would you stop by the sign-in list and uh, uh, put in your round-trip mileage for us, please? Thank you. Mm -hmm.